Om Ajnana Timanandasya Gyanandana Salakya Shakshur Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurave Nama Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Shimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nityanami Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesa Sunyavadi Pasyachari Satarine It is not an ordinary soul that can come to Vrindavan at the end of their life. It's not an ordinary soul that can stay in Vrindavan. But Srila Prabhupada was not an ordinary sadhu in Vrindavan. He was not behaving like an ordinary sadhu. Most would go there to retire and to prepare the end of life focused on Krishna with a desire to never leave and to attain the spiritual world at the end of their life by the grace of the Dhamma. Prabhupada was not like that. Prabhupada was there typing in the early morning, typing his translations. This Swami was always typing. This Swami was translating. And this Swami was clearly not content just staying in Vrindavan. He had another purpose. He would travel, travel to Delhi, going there into the heart of <coughs> Old Delhi, to Chippewada, to a printer, mm, to print his magazines. And eventually, the printer himself said, why not publish books? They last longer. And so, Prabhupada began to produce his books and particularly Srimad Bhagavatam. This Srimad Bhagavatam, the first canto, he published in, th in three parts. He never knew. He never knew where the money was going to come from. And so he published the first part of the first canto, and he put everything in there in case he would not be able to do any more. Then he did the second part, and then finally the third part. Therefore, we know that the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam uh, is most special. Uh, Prabhupada put everything there, everything. Mm -hmm. He crossed the ocean and on a mission mm, risked his life, almost died two heart attacks. So all that is the the hardship, the early days in New York, just hardship. Uh, staying on the Bowery, on this loft with a crazy man, amidst a, sne a smelly neighborhood, smelly of beer and, and urine on, on the Bowery, where so many bums were living on the street. Rough. Prabhupada was, was prepared, prepared to take that austerity and entered into deep, deep philosophical discussions. Um, very soon, uh, very soon his early followers began to understand the difference between personalism and impersonalism. And Prabhupada systematically uh, defeated it. systematically. Mm. In this way,
Prabhupada was gradually, gradually amongst hippies who didn't know what their purpose was, finding um, some more serious followers who became his disciples. And amongst those, um, some became more dedicated than others. And so his movement was born. Um, that movement grew, his matchless gift storefront, with the help of Mukunda and Carl Jurgens, it was obtained. In that New York storefront, um, Prabhupada started the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Although at the time there was a handful of hippies, he had that vision of the world. He all along, he didn't come to New York to come to New York. He came to New York as the gateway to the world. He always saw New York as the gateway to the world. And that was his purpose when he chanted in Matchless Gift storefront or in Tompkins Square Park under that tree. Um, all that was there. A lot of struggle, a lot of difficulty, uh, not much support, uh, the little support from uncommitted people who were still taking drugs and coming from wild backgrounds. Uh, but Prabhupada persevered. And with his sincerity, with his personal dedication, with his deep knowledge, based in scripture, um, pointing at the pure absolute truth, devotional service, Prabhupada conquered. He conquered. And, and so he came to, to victory. Um, the victory we see. Um, we see how New York took off uh, from 26 Second Avenue to 81 Second Avenue, a more developed, now a whole floor in a building. Uh, and eventually from Henry Street to 55th Street in New York, a major, a, a major landmark, uh, a huge, huge building. Prabhupada's mission was growing worldwide. Devotees had gone. Uh, Prabhupada said, yes, one. He called his teenage, mostly teenage followers and said, each of you can open a temple. And Rukmini, who was something like 17, said, even the girls, Prabhupada said, on the spiritual platform, there is no difference. Uh, everyone, yeah, Jai, then you have to also open a temple in one country. <laughs> you just said it. Ah, jai, you said Jai. Now, now we hold you to it. Ah. Uh, do it. Open a temple. And start. Hmm? Yes. Here it is. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll come and visit. I'll convince the other Swamis to visit as well. Yes, let's do something. That was Prabhupada. Something practical. So Prabhupada's Success spread widely uh, around the world in, an, in a number of years. Prabhupada's followers were everywhere mm, in many major countries of the world. Prabhupada made a return to India and began in India to develop his larger projects. Uh, like after I had been to temples in the West, said, okay, this is some sort of uh, nice movement, right? Nice movement. Uh, some, lots of young people and, and so on, and nice Sunday feasts. But when I came to uh, Mumbai, right, and I saw those towers, then I thought, wow, this is something. 
it's some sort of, this is, a, is an establishment. This is not just uh, some bunch of hippies, you know, with smelly feet on a Sunday feast to come for a free meal. This is, is a big, a big movement, a big established movement. In India, Prabhupada gained traction like that. Um, he established Bombay, he established he established Vindavan, he established Mayapur, all major projects. Um, and eventually it became clear. Prabhupada said there were two purposes. One to distribute books, the other one to establish Mayapur. Uh, and these are the two main main items of focus in his in his mission. Um, And Srila Prabhupada went to, to England. Um, that was special because having grown up in India under British subjugation, having been educated in the Scottish Church College, uh, Prabhupada naturally uh, had so much British history. He had been educated in British history. Sometimes with Dhananjaya, he would discuss British history, right? Just because he had been educa educated in it. So coming to the UK me really meant something. And still Prabhupada went to New York first. But then in, in, in London, uh, in 1973, that Ratiyatra, that Ratiyatra, which was legendary, legendary, because that Ratiyatra in 1973, it was a victory march. Prabhupada was conquering London. London had come and for so long conquered India, subjugated India. Uh, and Prabhupada said sometimes things like uh, he was in Gujarat, and he had, uh, driving on a car, and he had like a white servant standing on the board of the car. The car had like a board on the side, you know, like fancy car. Proud driving. White servant. I said, yes. Uh, white servant. <laughs> 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 yes. Hmm. Oh. oh, yes, yes, yes. But Prabhupada said white. <laughs> Just to show, you know, like, yes, and why not? Uh, why not? Because the, the false, false fame of people based on money and power instead of the real glory based on genuine spiritual knowledge. Uh, yes. Uh, Brahmananda's mother came and, and, and Prabhupada, she came to the temple and Prabhupada asked her for a donation. So she said, I gave you two of my sons. Right? Two. Right? And now you still ask me for a donation as well. Right? It's like, anyway. Another time she said, you know, you know, these boys, they are worshipping you. They are worshipping you. And Prabhupada said, yes. He said, they're bowing down to you. He said, yes, I'm bowing down to my spiritual master as well. And from then on, he told Brahmananda to bow down to his mother <laughs> when she would come. And she liked it. <laughs> Although I said, no, 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 don't do that. But she liked it. <laughs> ah. Even the mothers, he purchased the mothers. Um, Giriraj Maharaj is was staying in India and his parents, his father was a, a, an established lawyer and so his parents came and they had a desire that their son would go back. Uh, so they were saying, for his health, you know, for his health. I mean, it's really like here in India, he's so skinny. No, he is so skinny. He's never been so skinny in his life. He's really unhealthy. He should come to America for some time to regain his health. Prabhupada didn't say anything. Then Prabhupada arranged for some some uh, nice sandesh to be brought out, Mongolarty sweets. So um, the mother said, please taste, taste. She tasted. Prabhupada said, is it nice? She said, oh yes, it's, it's very nice. 
Very good. Very good. Prabhupada said, yes, yes, it is very good. Not only does it taste very good, he said, but it is full of protein. And I will give your son every day, I will give them these sweets. So don't you worry, I'll take care of him. <laughs> then, they, then they couldn't say anything. Uh, uh. One devotee came and said, Prabhupada, he said, I don't like India. Prabhupada said, why not? He said, oh, you know, Indians, Indians, they are so tricky. And then he felt good as good. But not you, Srila Prabhupada, not you. <laughs> and then Prabhupada said, wrong, wrong. I'm very tricky. I tricked you all into Krishna consciousness. Uh, so yes, it is true. Um, I was also tricked into Krishna consciousness. I had no desire. It was not that I was small as a child and that I wanted to be a Hare Krishna. That was <laughs> not my goal in life at all. And when I saw them walking around in the street in these robes and jumping up and down in the street with bold heads, I was convinced they were dangerous religious fanatics. <laughs> Very much so. And it kept a, a safe distance. But somehow or other, Krishna also makes arrangements and I got a dog and the dog threw a girlfriend and the dog's name was Krishna so in this way somehow or other Krishna came anyway <laughs> and I came closer and closer and start reading the books then these books were not just sweet books about Krishna they were not just nice, inspiring books. No, that was not it. These books, they were hammering. They were hammering my heart. I was reading them, and every time the book was sort of telling me, so this is the truth for these and these reasons, and anybody who is sincere will accept this and surrender unto Krishna. So basically, the book kept on telling me, if you don't accept, if you know, if you see that this is truth, and you don't accept it, then you're not sincere. So I was getting like a, uh, an identity crisis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm walking around here, trying to think of myself as sincere, and Prabhupada is just proving to me that I'm not sincere. It was too much. It forced me. I felt like my arm was being twisted by <laughs> these books. That it twisted my arms. It forced me. It forced me to take it, although I didn't want it. Like this. Um, See, the Prophet called it his hammering technique. Um, this hammering technique of preaching, certainly I experienced it. Um, I could see. And gradually, uh, gradually everything became clear. I would, like so many of my generation, be interested in spirituality and, and one day I would be with the Sufis and the next day I would be doing the Tibetan Book of the Dead and you know and the next day we were doing some uh, biokinetics you know some uh, uh, and we were all searching and uh, and it all seemed it was all spiritual it was all spiritual man it was really spiritual, <laughs> yes. But uh, then, um, Prabhupada was not sentimental. Prabhupada was not all about love, all about holding hands in a circle and sitting around, as was quite common in the days. And even nowadays, in the, in the rainbow gatherings still going on, but so many times I came into a room and everyone in the circle holding hands, you know. I was like, okay. Yeah, make you feel good. <laughs> I always felt a little weird, actually, to tell you the truth. Um, some young people dressed in, in jackets made of old carpets, uh, <laughs> yeah, looking, yeah, looking at all these things thinking, what's this all about? Um, I know they were seeking, I know I was seeking, I knew I was seeking, and I knew 
they didn't find it. Um, but Prabhupada was not into that mood of, of sentimental love. Um, Prabhupada showed what real love was. Um, and that real love means that we appreciate that for love there is need of a person. You cannot just have that impersonal universal love. What is that? Some sort of sentimental wet blanket right? of love. Something gooey, something sticky, something whatever it is, something undefined. Prabhupada defined love as love means there has to be a person, someone with a heart. Nirvishesa um, Sunyavadi. Yes, Kirtanananda was saying, why, why are you always preaching against impersonalism? Huh? I mean, maybe in India, huh? ah, in India, so many, ah, ah. but here in the West, huh? said, there are no impersonalists in the West, why not preach against atheism in the West? And Prabhupada said, you're saying that because you are an impersonalist. <laughs> Straight. Boom. Yeah. And it's true. We are the impersonalists. Yes. Uh, the impersonalists who, yes, who were not really ready for, uh, for Krishna, right? Blackish blue. Uh, is your God blue? We heard these kind of questions. Uh, I remember one devotee left the movement, you know, we called it blooped in those days, back, bloop, back into the ocean of material existence. And he wrote a book, God, after three years after he left, he wrote a book, God, a blue boy. See how deep it went. <laughs> he could, even after three years, he still had to write a book about Krishna. <laughs> yes. So, Srila Prabhupada brought us Krishna, made us understand Krishna, made us properly respect Krishna. Huh? Now, in Vrindavan, we see so much. <laughs> it's all like disco. Eh? <laughs> Disco, you get these electronic disco voices over the, over, through the speaker, right? Nicely mastered in some music editing program. And it's, it's all Radhavani. And it's, but Prabhupada said, no, Srimati Radharani. Uh, pointing out how exalted is Srimati Radharani. How, how pure, how dedicated. And she is full of spiritual opulence. Prabhupada brought us Krishna, made us understand Krishna, made us understand how to, how to worship Krishna, taught us everything, how to eat, how to sleep, how to do anything, how to dress, uh, everything. Taught us how to really live. Uh, Mukunda. Mukunda was helping Prabhupada in so many ways in the beginning and one day Prabhupada came to Mukunda's place and on the wall there was a, a poster, a colorful poster of Europe. Right? And Prabhupada saw the poster and said, that is horrible. And then it turned out that it was a poster of a bullfight. But he had never looked at it, you know, it never registered like that. It was just colorful, exotic Europe, kind of, you know poster, colorful exotic Europe on the wall. And Prabhupada just pierced right through that layer of illusion. This is not colorful exotic Europe. This is, is a man slaughtering a bull and people cheering. Prabhupada made everything crystal clear, crystal clear. Gave people responsibility. Uh, not kumbaya, right? We're all happy in the Hare Krishna movement, happy devotees. You know, that's Disney World. Uh, the Hare Krishna movement was a movement where Prabhupada gave people responsibility. Um, in Mayapur, 
uh, the managers were held responsible by Prabhupada. Prabhupada would walk with them and, and point out why is that why are those plants yellow? Hmm, it's like uh, well probably they're not getting any water uh, Srila Prabhupada says so like why are they not getting any water? It's like you know we're not scientists, you know. I mean, how do we know, right? No, that was not the reason why. Why are they not getting any water? Meant you are in charge here, and you have to provide water. You are responsible for every living being here, for their welfare. That's what it means to be in charge. Um, there was one bathroom which was blocked, a festival bathroom, and, and it smelled, and it was overflowing, and this and that. And Prabhupada said, what is this? He said, it's blocked, Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, if you see the mode of ignorance, and you don't do anything about it, that means you are in the mode of ignorance. So, so it wasn't just all so easy, it wasn't just all so sweet, it wasn't just all, here's the loving, blissful Srila Prabhupada Kijai. It was like hard work. It's like hard work to care, to care about everything. It was about taking responsibility in service and caring, because that is love. That is a person. Uh, when you deal with a person, he, the person has preferences, likes and dislikes. Krishna has likes and dislikes, therefore he wants it in a particular way. And scripture explains, and Prabhupada explained, uh, everything for the pleasure of Krishna, nicely arranged. So, Srila Prabhupada gave us his teachings, the form of scriptures that he translated and wrote purports to. Srila Prabhupada gave us the holy name. Srila Prabhupada gave us kirtan. Srila Prabhupada personally cooked incredible Sunday love feasts. Um, he gave us prasadam. Srila Prabhupada gave us temples. Srila Prabhupada gave us a full way of life. And Srila Prabhupada said, these devotees in these temples, he said, they have everything. They live in palaces. As if you think about it, look here. This place is better than what the neighbors have. Yeah. It's better than an apartment. You know, we live in palaces, yes. He said, they have the best place to live. They eat the best food. Right? They wear the best clothes because they grow with you as you grow or like that. Uh, they wear the best clothes. They, they have everything. Prabhupada said that good fortune is rolling at their feet. So Prabhupada gave us a way of life. And we can believe in it. We can believe in it. Now, in Srila Prabhupada's time, and that's the last thing I will say, in Srila Prabhupada's time, he kept this movement quite simple, quite close to the, uh, um, to the scriptures, to the lifestyle of the scriptures. Prabhupada did not integrate so much in this modern society as we are doing now. It was not that he was, uh, was saying that that is forbidden, but it was not the model that he, he, uh, he based his movement on. Prabhupada's followers start to wear these clothes, uh, were eating on the floor, seated on the floor with their hands, right, instead of knife and fork and so on, all those things which were alien to a Westerner. On the floor. Uh, like Satsarup Maharaj said he was still uninitiated, Steve, he, he, he needed some, he needed to work overtime, he had a job. He said there was no one in the temple that he could think of that could save prasadam for him, except Swamiji. So he called Swamiji, Swamiji can you save me a plate of prasadam? 
Then he comes later and he meets Swamiji. He says, Swamiji, you saved the Pasada? Yes, Swamiji said, yes, yes, yes. Don't worry. Yes. And then he brought the Pasada, Prabhupada, and puts it in front of him while he's still standing on the floor. And he looks like, on the floor? On the floor? I'm not a dog. <laughs> And, and, but Prabhupada was smiling so nicely, so nicely, right, that he just said, like, he felt so guilty that he offered his obeisances, he says. He offered his obeisances for the first time, right, just to make up for his, his out of guilt, really, but also out of respect. He said, you yeah. know, so like this, um, Prabhupada conquered, philosophically conquered hearts, uh, provided for everyone, took personal care of, of everyone, um, and engaged everyone immediately in demanding service, offered the devotees a simple lifestyle based on a traditional culture related to Lord Chaitanya. And uh, now, we look back and, and uh, from ISKCON 2021 and it may look uh, a little bit rigid, the old, the old Hare Krishna. Right. And uh, it may look like that. But it was also, in some ways it was, but in other ways it was very transcendental. A lot of material things would not come in. Toshan Krishna says that in 1970 he was ill. He had some flu, he really was sick. And everybody went out from the temple all day to distribute books, but he stayed back that day. And then he did what he never did before. He went across the street. He went into a supermarket. Can you believe it? supermarket inside din of sin and he went straight to the shelf bought a one and a half liter carton of orange juice then went to the temple offered it to Krishna can you believe it unheard of and drank the whole thing <laughs> vitamin C. <laughs> then, <laughs> then he felt better. But things like that were unheard of. Uh, once it was heard that Prabhupada had taken seven up on a plane, oh, then seven up was bona fide. <laughs> it, the, the devotees started crated in by the crates, fizzy pop, they called it. And everywhere, my God, seven up, that was the drink. Uh, bona fide. <laughs> Prabhupada. Then, then it extend. That's only lemon. Lemons, lemon in the Shivanam. In India, it became limka. Ah, limka. Yeah. Anyway, it expanded. Uh, and now, we've moved on from orange juice <laughs> and Seven Up. So, wherever we are, I hope it's still vegetarian. I, I hope, and I hope that we're reading the ingredients on the packaging and so on. Ah. Uh, but, you know, to just don't eat anything store-bought and to make everything ourselves, right? That was nice, actually, if you think about it. Uh, once upon a time, the Har in the Hare Krishna movement, they wouldn't buy all these things, these prefabbed things. They were unacceptable. Just make our own, fresh, like that. Anyway, it was an interesting world. The early ISKCON, uh, Palatananda Maharaj always tells us stories, you know, how, like yesterday, he was the head pujari, but he didn't know what the deities were and stuff like this. <laughs> that sort of. <laughs> so we can imagine what Prabhupada was dealing with, uh, what he was dealing with. But it, despite of all that, he gave us a very simple, uh, way of Krishna consciousness, um, also providing for being in the world 
and being Krishna conscious in a job and so on. So he gave shelter for all and, uh, and now here we are on this day celebrating, celebrating his appearance, celebrating the great gift that he gave us and deeply appreciating that he gave meaning to our life uh, that he gave us a reason to live, that he taught us how to live, that he gave us places to live, that he gave us everything, everything one needs to live in this world uh, and have all our needs fulfilled and to use this life to go back to Godhead um, and that great gift Srila Prabhupada gave the world. And now, and let us assist him. Uh, Prabhupada immediately um, assisted people, uh, engaged people in assisting in that uh, first program in Butler in the YMCA. Uh, Prabhupada had gone there after landing in New York, stayed there for some time, invited by Gopal Agarwal and his wife Sally Agarwal, stayed there and did a program in the YMCA. He was early, sat there uh, on a seat in the audience. One man sat next to him. And Prabhupada started up a conversation. It turned out Prabhupada, under his seat, he had a box. And he said to the man, could you just uh, look after this box for me? And as they called him onto the stage. Uh, and then Prabhupada gave his lecture. At the end of the lecture, it turned out that there were books in the book. Prabhupada said, I also have books. He said to the man, Sir, could you take out some of the books out of the box? Sir, could you hold them up in the air? And Prabhupada said, Yes, if anybody is interested in these books, then please see this gentleman over there. Sir, would you mind taking the money? And, like, you know, <laughs> and he just <laughs> engaged him immediately. That was Srila Prabhupada. Let us also, uh, let us also be engaged, engaged in what is dear to Srila Prabhupada. And if we do so, uh, everything in our life will, will transform for the better and better and better. And let us see how good it can become, but better than best. That we can guarantee. Thank you very much, Srila Prabhupada. Ki <laughs> Nothing left to say. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gyanajana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruvena Maha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaurvani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavari Pastyatyare Satarine Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nitananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Sivasari Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Thank you Maharaj or such a sweeping description of Prabhupada's life. <laughs> um, where to begin? Oh. About that point that Maharaj made about the importance of love, there's one incident in the uh, life of Srila Prabhupada, which is one of my, you might say, outstanding experiences when hearing Prabhupada's pastimes, something that made a, made a big difference in my life. And this particular incident was told by uh, Shruti Kirti Prabhu, who was Hila Prabhupada's servant for two years from 1974 all the way to, no, actually 1972 to 1974. Shruti Kirti Prabhu was uh, a lot of times traveling with Srila Prabhupada. We know tra Prabhupada traveled from place to place just to spread Krishna consciousness. Although at the age of 70 years old, 
And this was brought up many times by people who were of that age, who felt, wow, how is it possible that such an elderly person can begin a life's mission at the age of 70? When we think, wow, at that age, you know, people either retire or, you know, become less active. Prabhupada was beginning his whole life at 70 years old, traveling around the world. And Prabhupada had, you know, difficulties with his health, but he pushed that aside in order to continue to preach Krishna consciousness. But there's one interesting story which, or you might say an incident in the life of Srila Prabhupada, where Prabhupada was traveling with Shruti Kirti Prabhu on a, tr on a plane and they came into one airport and the devotees had been there waiting for Srila Prabhupada to arrive and the anticipation of Prabhupada getting off the plane was always really high energy they would look at the passengers at the, as they were deplaning and waiting for Prabhupada and as soon as police would see Prabhupada they would explode into a kirtan not only a kirtan but an emotional outbreak where sometimes devotees would just by seeing Srila Prabhupada this is how much he entered deep into the hearts of the devotees they would cry <laughs> they would cry sometimes they would even <laughs> roll on the ground or just show ex emotional ex experiences of happiness in a very very exuberant way so Shruti Kirti he's with Prabhupada He's seeing all this, and he's thinking, wow, my God brothers and God sisters, they have so much love for Prabhupada, but I don't feel like that. So he's thinking like that. So now Prabhupada goes back to his place, and Shruti Kirti begins his service. So in beginning his service, you know, he has to take care of all of Prabhupada's needs, but one very important part was to give Prabhupada a massage. And he did that every day. Usually after Prabhupada would take rest after breakfast, Prabhupada would get up and then take a massage before before lunch. And sometimes it would a a last from an hour and a half to two hours. Prabhupada said, my massage and my morning walk gave me 10 more years of life. He said, when I had my third heart attack in 1967, the doctor said, you were meant to leave. My astrologer said, this was the, this was the time when you were supposed to go. But Prabhupada said, I prayed. I prayed to Krishna, please give me more time. My mission has re really not developed. And Prabhupada, gave, Prabhupada later said, Prabhupada, he gave me 10 more years. That was towards the end of his life. And now, Shruti Kirti, he's thinking, wow, you know, Srila Prabhupada, you devotees. And then he has to ask. So he says to Srila Prabhupada, you know, your devotees, they have so much love for you. But Prabhupada, I don't feel like that. Now Prabhupada didn't say anything. He remained quiet. And then he remained con completely quiet through the entire massage. Suddhikirti is now thinking, maybe I asked the wrong question. I shouldn't have said that. So his mind is confused. Well, what, Prabhupada's not respond, responding. What happened? And so Prabhupada goes and finishes his massage, takes a, his uh, bath, gets ready for lunch. Suddhikirti makes it, endeavors to arrange for his lunch. And then finally, it's time for lunch. He brings in Prabhupada's lunch. Prabhupada's still quiet, doesn't say anything. He's, Prabhupada's taking his lunch. He would usually take his lunch alone, unless there was some very, very special guest. But usually he would eat alone, saying, this is Krishna. And therefore, we should absorb ourselves in the meditation that Krishna has come in the form of prasadam. I was when I was in Los Angeles. They showed me a place where Prabhupada would take his prasadam. It was a little table, and it was facing the wall. <laughs> they would put the 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 uh, prasadam in front of Prabhupada on the table, and he would look at the wall, so he wouldn't get distracted when he was honoring the Lord's mercy. And so now, Prabhupada's done, and he he has his little bell, 
He rings his bell, Shruti Kirti comes in, pays his obeisances, and just when he's about to take the plate, Papa said, do you like your service? And Shruti Kirti said, oh yes, Prabhupada, very much. He said, that is love. That is love. He said, jumping up and down, yeah, that's nice. But real, the actual exhibition of love means to serve. So he made that point very strongly that this what is how we can express our love for Krishna, for Prabhupada, and for Prabhupada's mission by engaging in devotional service. But the idea of trying to do it in the best possible way. You see that those who are engaged in devotional service, they have no problems. Because they don't have no time for problems. <laughs> Prabhupada used to say that if you're just busy in Krishna consciousness, all your problems will go away. As soon as you stop, then all the problems will come. <laughs> Usually that's the case. So this is a, a nice point to understand how important it is to we want to develop our love for Krishna, so it's done through the mood of serving service with the desire to please the object of our service. Of course, Srila Prabhupada, the devotees, and of course, Lord Sri Krishna. So that's, that was a very powerful point that I found the most interesting because, as Maharaj was saying, people can act in so many different ways and express so many things. But real love means to show, to give your time, the time that we've been given, to serve in such a way that we want to please the object of our service. And that enthusiasm is an expression of bhakti. It's an expression of bhakti. So sometimes we see devotees, they, they like to chant. <laughs> and they like to come to classes, but when it comes to service, can't find them. <laughs> so yeah, this is, I'm just mentioning this because the temple president's here. <laughs> so the, the point is that this is where we can offer, uh, this is where we actually connect with Krishna and with Srila Prabhupada. Another point I wanted to make and one point that Prabhupada also kind of emphasizes is that Devotees don't read my books. Prabhupada said that. 1976, in Mayapur, he was saying to the book distributors, you're out there, you're distributing books, but someone asks you what is in the book, you say, oh, well, uh, our master, he writes and we simply sell. <laughs> That's all. So we're seeing, and even now, today, there's been a, a concern that devotees don't read enough of Srila Prabhupada's book. Everything you want to know, any subject, and this is a simple a quote from Srila Prabhupada, everything's in Prabhupada's books. And Prabhupada said, everything's in Srimad Bhagavatam. All categories of life, anything you need to know, anything you need to make progress in devotional service is in Srila Prabhupada's books. So this is a very uh, strong emphasis that Srila Prabhupada gave. Please read my books. He said, I wrote the books for my devotees. It's not I wrote it for everyone else, but they also benefit from that. But I wrote it for the devotees. And we were seeing, just like uh, I think Perlada Nandamar was, was there in the ILS meeting many years ago, we took a survey. These are leaders all around the movement. And the survey was a listing of, some of Prabhupada's books. And how many times have you read each of these books in your life? 259 devotees were at that meeting. And the results were really, really poor. And these were the leaders. Some even, even less than 1% in some of the Srimad Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita. I remember Pallada Nanda Maharaj, he, he read Bhagavad Gita 130 times, I think. Is it more than that now? <laughs> I'm still reading. Still reading. <laughs> He's an example of Prabhupada's you know, books, he reads them every day. 
everything. And it's, he shows by example, but he also has a taste for reading these books. So sometimes we think, well, you know, how do you get that taste? You get the taste by doing it. <laughs> when you just continue to read, you'll find that that taste will come. I can tell you a nice experience I had. Of course, it just doesn't, I don't want to put myself in a special platform. But Prabhupada had said, when he was asked the question, how will we associate with you when you, when you leave, when you leave us? Prabhupada said, I'm in my books. You read my books, you can have my association. Not only just theoretical, but direct. He says, these words are my ecstasies and love for, for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So one day I was, in, I was in my room in Chicago and I was just reading Srimad Bhagavatam and I was reading for quite a while. It was more than two hours. Just reading, 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 reading. And something happened. It only happened once in my life. I didn't, I wasn't reading the words anymore. I was hearing Srila Prabhupada's voice speaking the words as I was reading them. Something just completely changed, and it went on for some time. And as I was reading the words, I could hear Prabhupada speaking the words as I was reading them, and then it stopped after some time. Since then, it hasn't, hasn't happened. Prabhupada wanted to say, yeah, I'm in my books, I told you. <laughs> I'm in my books. And that is not some figurative statement. He is literally <coughs> manifested himself personally in these books. So they're so important. And we're out there distributing books, but we also have to read. And each and every one of us should be in a position to, when we have to respond to any kind of questions, we should always know what Prabhupada said in regards to whatever particular question. And if we're asked to give a class, we should say yes. <laughs> yeah, because uh, when I first came to Krishna consciousness, even after I took sannyas, I, I was so nervous I couldn't speak in front of people. I would shake. And they told me, you're a sannyasi, you've got to speak. <laughs> I said, oh my, I think, isn't there any other services? <laughs> so, but I was forced to. And then I had, I had to get over that anxiety and nervousness that I used to have throughout my whole life. I never liked public speaking. I, w I would just run. My teachers in school would say, where is he? <laughs> I wouldn't. But, and, uh, but after somehow or other getting the mercy of Srila Prabhupada through his books, I developed a sense of confidence in what I was speaking about because I understood this is truth. And someone, you, people sometimes ask me, what is it about Srila Prabhupada that was so outstanding that attracted you to Srila Prabhupada? People have responded to that question in different ways. But for me, what was the most outstanding thing was Prabhupada said, this is it. This is the truth. It's not like maybe, perhaps, theoretical. This is truth. Prabhupada's surety combined with his purity, made his words just clear, so clear. And that, that, is, that, that is Krishna consciousness. So we want to please Srila Prabhupada. This whole gathering for glorifying Prabhupada is about what we can learn through glorifying Prabhupada and hearing others glorify Prabhupada. What we can learn in our Krishna consciousness, what we can take away and move forward in spiritual life. Festivals are not just about having a nice time and then going on. What can we learn from the life of Srila Prabhupada's teachings that we can imbibe in our own Krishna consciousness that will increase our devotional service, will increase and spread Krishna consciousness to others. And Prabhupada also said one thing, and this was really powerful. He said, do what I'm doing. <laughs> Think about that one. Do what I'm doing. And what did he mean? Preach. No one could preach like Prabhupada, obviously. 
You know, he was on another platform. But what he wanted us to do to assist him in bringing the conditioned souls to Krishna consciousness. So when whatever you might think, well, how do I do that? If you have the desire, the intelligence and the understanding will come. You have to have that desire. And if we have that desire, we become empowered to do things on behalf of Srila Prabhupada. So Prabhupada is there for all of us. We are all devotees of Srila Prabhupada, not just those who are initiated by Prabhupada, but each and every devotee who comes into this movement has a direct relationship with Srila Prabhupada as he is the founder acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. He is the Shiksha Guru for each and every one of us. And everything we do, everything we say, everything we try to increase, everything is based on what Srila Prabhupada has given us by his example and by his words. So everything we say, with our whole movement centers around Srila Prabhupada. So don't let Prabhupada fade into the background as some, you know, image that came at 50 years ago and now things have changed. He's still very much with us and it's his, it's his movement and that's the difference between success in our Krishna consciousness and failure. So thank you very much. His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki Om Agyana Timurandasya Gananjana Salakaya Chaksur Unalitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Maum Vishnu Vidaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhaktivedanta Swami Tanamane Namaste Saraswatam Deve Gauravani Bhacharane Nirvishe Shashan Yvadi Paskatya De Satarane so I'd like to offer my thanks to the two other speakers. Let's see if I can say a little bit that might be helpful. Uh, I've been in this movement for, I think this is my 52nd year so far. I'm trying to make it to 53. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I do, 68 or in 2000, so it is 53, 54. When I first joined the Hare Krishna movement, even before I joined it, I had heard about Prabhupada in 1966 because I was reading the East Village Other, it was called, and there was an article about Prabhupada, Swamiji coming on this boat to America but I just couldn't relate to it. I didn't exactly know what the whole thing was about. And then in 1968, at the beginning of 68, one of my friends taught me the Hare Krishna mantra. I thought that's nice, I mean, I didn't really understand anything about it, but it took me a while even to learn it. <laughs> and then in 1968, I was just walking along and then one day in Buffalo and then my whole world changed. And I realized that actually the purpose of life is to find out God, whoever that might be. And that immediately within week, that week I became a vegetarian, did yoga eight hours a day. Besides my, besides my classes I was attending, got a job as a, in between my classes and the yoga. I was working as a model doing yoga exercises. <laughs> I started to study astrology, etc., etc. Even read the Bible, which is uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then one of my friends, because I figured that I should find some center where I can learn how to become a monk, or something like that. So I was inquiring, and one of my friends, his name was Jeffrey Hickey. He later, uh, he later on became Jagadish Swami for some time. And then uh, he told me that they opened a little center 
on LaSalle Avenue, which was a couple of blocks from the University of Buffalo, which I was attending. So I said, all right, is it a Buddhist monk? Is it a Buddhist monastery? He said, no. He said, well, anyhow, I'll go and check it out. So this temple, I mean, if you call it a temple, it was a shack, actually. It was an old abandoned railroad shack. <laughs> and they never fixed the floor. So when you walked into the building, you could actually see the, what would have been the basement, what was actually the ground, because the, f the floor was caved in. And they had, on the shelf, they had these three, I didn't know what they were exactly. One was black, one was white, one was yellow. <laughs> And that was, the, that was the first floor. And they had a kitchen in the back. And then you walked up the steps and there were some rooms there. So I sat down, they were chanting Hare Krishna. And this huge cockroach just walked over my, my foot. And I thought, Mike, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> this is too much. You know? <laughs> and then I was looking at my Jeff, uh, Jeffrey Hickey at that time, and his, his sister was there, and there was another devotee, and a devotee named Rupanuga. And I, I was paid, I said, well, this is yoga, this is the only thing I know about yoga that, that's around here, so I stayed. And every, then I was going up to the center, they had a class three times a week, Rupanuga was giving a Bhagavad Gita class on one verse, because they, didn't, they only had one verse to read from. And they didn't have a purport. It was only the verse. <laughs> so I attend the class, and my main object was to defeat him. <laughs> because I was reading all these kind of literatures, and I, and I couldn't defeat him. So if you can't beat them, then join them. <laughs> so then I started to chant rounds. Anyhow, at the beginning, we may have this very, you know, nostalgic idea of what Krishna consciousness was. But from my experience, it was like, it was flowing. It wasn't always flowing in the right direction all the time, but it was definitely flowing by the, by the influence of the devotees who were joining and the devotees who were disappearing because at the beginning, so many devotees came. I remember the first time I moved into this shack from my, I was still a student at the university, going to the university, but I went there. I said, because I was chanting 25 rounds a day, and one day I realized I was on the bus with my roommate, who also joined the movement, and we were living, you know, maybe 20 mi 15 miles away from the, where the temple was, where the university was. And I was chanting, and I noticed that everyone on the bus suddenly became happy. So I thought, wow, this is really powerful. <laughs> Everyone's happy here except for me. And then I went to this devotee's house, and his sister and his, her father were, quarrel, were fighting with each other. So I was chanting, and suddenly they made up. I said, wow, this is really powerful. I, I better keep on doing this. And I thought, the only way I'll possibly be able to keep on chanting is if I join the temple. So then my, my roommate and myself, we moved into the temple. And we slept on the floor, on the first floor where they had the, the room which was caved. And I turned to one of the devotees, who is a sannyasi now in the movement, and I said, isn't this wonderful that now we're in the Hare Krishna movement? And he looked at me and said, before we went to sleep, he said, a lot of devotees, a lot of people come here and a lot of people leave. <laughs> I said, oh, <laughs> that's really encouraging. <laughs> <Your move>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, the only thing that anyone really knew at that time was Prabhupada, and that's all they talked about was Prabhupada, because we didn't know anything else. The first Bhagavatam class I heard, before I moved into the temple, I, there was this person called Ashvatama, and he threw an atomic weapon at Arjuna on, on a chariot. The whole universe was about to be destroyed. So, oh. <laughs> this is the other part of the philosophy. <laughs> The only thing I was hearing for like months was, you know, we're not this body. <laughs> and we had... <laughs>
So I myself, you know, I, as I said, we t I actually had another service I took up for a different reason. I became the Sankirtan leader. But I was like, uh, I wasn't the soft touch Sankirtan leader. Uh -huh. <laughs> I figured if I was going to go out, everyone else was going to go out too. <laughs> and we were not everyone was so surrendered. In any case, Prabhupada was, what, actually hearing about Prabhupada was what really kept the movement together because we didn't know anything. We didn't, when I joined, even after I was actually, I was married for one week. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I, I never found out what the name of my wife was. Though. <laughs> I, I saw her once. <laughs> He's better than I am. <laughs> in any case I my temple president told me if you want to become a leader then you have to get married and then he told me all these devotees who got you know married and the leaders and at that time if you were a temple president you were like you know there's the avatars and a little below them was the temple president <laughs> So I was, and I was actually a temple president for a little while there because Rupanuga got into an accident. So I became the temple president, agitated his wife to no degree. We didn't exactly have training in how to become a temple president at that time. In any case, so I thought, well, I want to take sannyas, but if you have to become, if you want to get married, then you can, I'll become a temple president, I'll become, I'll get married. If I want to become a leader, then I'll have to become a temple president and I had to get married, and so, okay, I'll do it. And besides that, the Bhushanam at that time was so poor, and if you got married, then you had a feast. <laughs> <laughs> so I figured it's probably worth it. So Rupanuga Vru wrote to Srila Prabhupada, and I was, I was convinced Prabhupada would say, no, no, he shouldn't get married. He should do, you know. Should. But Prabhupada wrote back, oh, very good idea, he should get married. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So anyhow, I, I got married, and uh, anyhow, because Prabhupada said I should get married, and then I discovered about, that my wife wanted romance, and I wanted to read the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> So I was reading the Bhagavad Gita to her, <laughs> and she'd fall asleep. I said, this is not going to work. <laughs> so anyhow, I was as direct and straightforward with her as I, is, as I was with everyone else. And she figured it would be a lot easier just to get up and leave <laughs> and deal with me. <laughs> But I didn't even, when I asked my temple president, you know, how many regular principles do we have to follow? He said he wasn't quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I had some idea that, you know, how many I wanted to follow at least. So at that time, anyhow, the point is, even I had, for, over the years, I had some direct association with Sri Prabhupada. And a lot of it was, we could say, transcendental. It gave me, you know, experiences even beyond what I can imagine now. And even at that time, I had experiences beyond what I, I have now. But I could see that our understanding of what Krishna consciousness was and what Prabhupada's understanding was, was quite different. But Prabhupada was very patient. And he tried to give whatever was practical for that time. And then after, and he engaged people. That's all he was really doing, was trying to engage people. I mean, I was on Radha Dharmadar. Radha Dharmadar, its motto was, tough as nails, hard as rocks. We hit the lots till 12 o'clock. Pick it to the bone and bring it on home. 
lay him down like a rug, six hours sleep, and put him back on the jug. <laughs> that's American age. <laughs> and that's what we were doing, you know. We had to be the best, and we're out there at 12, 1 o'clock at night, you know, into the supermarkets, the 24-hour supermarkets, distributing Prabhupada's books. <laughs> then it became incense, <laughs> along with the books, and it became, anyhow, it even became records for some time. But Prabhupada was quite patient. And uh, there wasn't so much emphasis upon reading his books. At the beginning there weren't any books. We only had this little blue Bhagavad Gita and the original three Srimad Bhagavatams. And it wasn't encouraged at all to read his books. I remember one time I roommate, I was with him, I was this little temple, and I was reading Srimad Bhagavatam. And my roommate came in and said, what are you doing? What are you wasting your time for? You know, stop reading that book. <laughs> so I'd stay up at night when everyone went to sleep, and I'd go to the room where there was one book called Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, and I'd read it because it was forbidden to do that. So anything I wasn't supposed to do, immediately I was interested in doing it, to find out why I wasn't supposed to read it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, yeah, it was quite interesting. In any case, after Prabhupada left, actually even when Prabhupada was here, one time we, we got on Radha Damodar, we got the sh one volume after another of Chaitanya Charitamrita. And somehow or another, my whole consciousness just changed. And they said, it doesn't really matter what they tell me. I'm just, because I was a party leader, so I drop off all the m members of the party. I just sit in the van for two or three hours and read Chaitanya Charitamrita. And then I'd go out for an hour or two. I was so fired up, I distributed more books than anyone else. And of course, distributing books didn't count how much Lakshmi you made. And I was pretty good at making Lakshmi, so. And then I pick up all the members and we come back. So that went on. So then I started to read Prabhupada's books regularly. And then after Srila Prabhupada left, I mean the whole the whole understanding, what we thought Krishna consciousness was, suddenly changed. Suddenly there and all these my friends who joined the movement with me or before me suddenly became Mahabhagavats. <laughs> And even I was supposed one one of the sannyasis told me that in the zone that I was in, the idea was you're supposed to bow down before him because he's a he's the Uttama Adhikari. So he said, when are you going to start chanting his mantra <laughs> and bowing down? And anyhow, I never did it. <laughs> <laughs> And things were strange. I mean, they were really strange. For me, at least. I became, and I, I mean, it was like a roller coaster. I was, I was in a cyclone or something for some years. And it wasn't so pleasant. But it was one day I was just, because I was the temple president in Dallas at that time, and there was so much controversy going on. And I said, the only shelter I have is Prabhupada. And I just started to think about Prabhupada. I just started to pray to Prabhupada and think about him. And then I realized that actually, this is why it's all happening. So that I could actually take shelter of Srila Prabhupada. And that became, you know, because my meditation with Prabhupada, my association with Prabhupada, I was always so much in awe and reverence with Srila Prabhupada. Because the experiences I had made me think that, you know, Prabhupada is, you know, he's definitely on some other world. And Prabhupada used to tease me about that. Like one time we were going to an engagement and Prabhupada was going with Prabhupada to a university and I was standing there looking at Prabhupada with awe and reverence and Prabhupada walked up to me with a big smile on his face. So he said, so how are you doing? And I was like shocked. And then when we went on the engagement, then when we were coming back, I was in the car in front of Srila Prabhupada, so I, every time, oh, I, 
every time I saw Prabhupada, I immediately bowed down in the car. And Prabhupada was watching and laughing. <laughs> That's what the devotees were telling me. Because I was so much in awe and reverence of Prabhupada. So then, you know, Prabhupada was always trying to make me a little bit more comfortable than I actually felt. So I felt that actually when I started to take shelter of Prabhupada, that my relationship with Prabhupada was actually increasing. I began to understand what Prabhupada, who he was and what he was doing. And he became the focus. And the only, I realized the only way I could actually understand Prabhupada was to read his books and try to follow what they said to read them and remember them. I spent one summer, well, it was a summer, it was a rainy season in, Phil in the Philippines. Tom Krishnamaraj had asked me to go there to help out one devotee, and it was a rainy season. So the rainy season meant all it did was rain, and when it stopped rain, we went out to university to distribute books, and when we weren't doing that, then I was with Purnachandra, who became Purnachandra Maharaj, and his wife. And in between, I just memorized the Bhagavad Gita. That I figured, if I was going to know what to do, I had to know what the Bhagavad Gita said. And besides that, if I gave a class, then if I didn't know what the Bhagavad Gita said, then how could I give a class? So I memorized it. And every day that's what I was doing, just learning five verses and then reviewing the previous five verses. And then I had re then Prabhupada, of course, remembering what the verses were and tried to assimilate them because I was doing that since I more or less joined the movement. Then I, I realized that actually if we wanted to keep in touch with Prabhupada and with Krishna as a super soul in the heart, and our acharyas, then we had to become independently thoughtful. Because all the, the leaders that we had, they were certainly sincere, but they didn't have a very clear understanding amongst themselves exactly what Krishna consciousness was, or how to achieve it, or what the direction of the movement was, where it should be going. And I had to find out for myself. I had to actually understand. Of course, Prabhupada sent some help. There was some devotee who was channeling Srila Prabhupada, and he gave uh, information that made everything, to me at least, crystal clear what was going on. And although the leaders at that time didn't appreciate it very much, but only time told, after some time went by, then everything what was being said became simpler. Everything became clearer. And still we're going through the same thing now. As is pointed out, you know, now we're in so-called pandemic, whatever else. But without understanding it from the point of view of Krishna consciousness, without understanding that this is just another phase of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement, that this is not some kind of phase in the material history, this is a phase in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement, and those who take shelter of Prabhupada at his instructions, and those who take shelter of those who take shelter of Prabhupada and his instructions, then Krishna will help as a super soul and actually guide us through this time so that we'll actually be part of the next, the golden 10,000 years. And gradually everything will be revealed, what Prabhupada said. Just like, for instance, Ayurveda. I studied, Tom, I was teaching the VIHE in Vrindavan. And one day when I was teaching Krishna book, had to memorize Krishna book. And I was teaching some other subjects like nectar devotion, whatever else. And one day Tom Krishnamara, who was also teaching at the VIHE, he said, you should teach some course on health. So when I was with Prabhupada, I was always amazed that how much he was expert at health. So I, I said, yeah, sure, I'll t teach a course about health. So I started to, I started to t study 
different modalities of health. And then I thought, well, Prabhupada, he taught Ayurveda. That's what his main study was. So then I studied Ayurveda for some time. And I taught for eight years Ayurveda. But I never really was so sure how it was connected with Krishna consciousness. I always thought, well, this is some kind of like extra thing I'm doing here. It's like I studied astrology also. So I thought it was some kind of extra thing. Almost like the yoga I was doing that we had to keep private. Then recently with this pandemic, because no one ever took health, most of the leaders, most of the devotees never took health very seriously in ISKCON. It was kind of, oh yeah, you're the health and welfare minister, whatever else, sure, another thing. Although I was teaching courses on it. But most of the devotees couldn't care less about their health. It was something that you did if you got, you know, nothing else. If you ate too much for too many days and you started thinking maybe I should do something about it <laughs> when you can't get off the bed. But then I realized, especially when it became prominent, that how much important it is to understand how this world is actually coming from Krishna also. That nothing is really independent from Krishna. That Krishna gave us all the sciences and the Vedas. And Prabhupada also throughout gave us all the sciences in Bhagavad, in Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita. They're all there, Ayurveda, Jyotiraveda, Dhanaraveda, sociology, everything is there. And this movement is meant to establish those things along with the chanting of the holy names. That all these different, that the perfect sciences are all there in our books. And if we actually want to have faith in Prabhupada, we want to have faith in Krishna, we want to have faith in our philosophy, we also have to accept even if we don't understand, if we're not expert at these sciences, we also have to accept them as coming from Krishna. Otherwise, we'll think Krishna is just some kind of, you know, theoretical cowherd boy, and Prabhupada was some old Indian gentleman who had some, you know, who's, who, had, who was a chemist in India, and he taught, he, he followed Ayurveda because, you know, he was Indian, and he was somehow or another, his grandmother told him to do it. No, actually, the whole Krishna and Bhagavad Gita, even that summary, he teaches all the philosophy we have to know. And our accepting of, uh, as much as we actually have faith in these sciences, as much as we have faith in Krishna consciousness, to that much we're actually going to have faith in Krishna. Doesn't mean that these other materialistic and atheistic demoniac sciences don't have their place in our life. Because, you know, the spiritual sciences, the materialistic, the sciences coming from the Vedas are not so much prominent in our society. And the lifestyle of our society is so in the, much in the mode of ignorance that includes, inclu including those who are living in, the sci in this society sometimes have to take shelter of, practically speaking, speculative experimental sciences for instance, if you get run over by a truck, then you probably don't want to go to an Ayurvedic hospital and have your pulse taken, at least not first. Just like, <laughs> just like one time with Kundamakana Maharaj, we were in Vrindavan, <laughs> and he, some, I, w I was with Bhakti Chaitanya Maharaj, we were doing a, we were having, it was part of the VHC. And suddenly someone runs into our room at 11 o'clock at night and said that Kandama Khanna Maharaj, who was in Maharaj at the time, he, he said he got shocked. I said, shocked? <laughs> How did he get shocked? He said, come immediately. So he went to his room. I said, you got shocked? He said, <laughs> he said no, I got shot, shot, shot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> Did I? <laughs> well, until we brought you to the hospital. <laughs> we brought you to two hospitals, actually. So in that case, you know, I didn't take his pulse. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Reiki's emergency. For me. <laughs> it actually works, so I, I've done it. <laughs> it keeps people alive for a little while. <laughs> So for, we do have to take shelter because, you know, as Prabhupada said, Prabhupada used the dictaphone, he used so many things. So the materialists have created so many things. But if we think this is superior knowledge to what Krishna gave, then we'll be deluded. And if we can't follow it, we can't, because Ayurveda re requires discipline. Krishna consciousness replies, re requires discipline. Ayurveda requires discipline of the tongue means you have to have a diet, as Prabhupada said, and, and you have to have medicine. That our diet is prasadam, and our medicine is the holy name. There is actually a science behind it. So that has to be established also. In other words, we actually have faith in what Prabhupada said. We have to investigate his books. Presently, of course, I'm on the GBC. And there's so many things that come up. But we, even the leaders have to have the patience to actually study Prabhupada's books, try to find out what Prabhupada wanted us to do. That if we become, we think we're too powerful and that it, we don't have time, we have too many things to do. You know, these books are so esoteric. You know, I read black, you read white. We both read, as William Blake said, we both read the Bible day and night. I read black and you read white. But that's not it. There is a reality. There is a conclusion. And every moment there's a conclusion, there's a reality. And it's up to us to find out what it is. And if we don't know what it is, if it's not crystal, crystal clear, then we have to become humble. And we think, well, we know everything. We already figured it all out. We have so much experience. You know, we have so many followers. We have so many things. You know, we have so much assets. We have so many things. Who, why should I have to go through the trouble of figuring it out? So many people accept whatever I say, and therefore it must be the truth. So actually, we have to, be, we have to remain humble. That the difference between reality and where we're at is quite vast. And therefore we have to take shelter of Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra. Yes, Guru is there. Yes, Sadhu is there. But we can't forget Shastra, which Guru and Sadhu are based on. And as Chandamali Maharaj said, that Prabhupada will speak to us if we actually want him to. He'll speak to us in the form of the deity, if we're qualified. Because Prabhupada is actually there in the form of the deity. And we'll be able to associate with him according to our faith and our qualification. If we really want Prabhupada to be, to be there, then he'll be there. And if we think it's just a statue that we're supposed to come, it's some ritual we're coming to, it, you know, we're doing Guru Puj because, you know, it's a nice song to sing. <laughs> then we'll be missing out on a great opportunity. Just like that story in New Vrindavan, where that lady, after New Vrindavan left Iskhan, and when they had Prabhupada, uh, Prabhupada's palace, and they had tours of it, very beautiful palace, that was dedicated to Srila Prabhupada. And then one lady came there, and she heard a voice. She was before the Prabhupada's Murti, and she heard a voice, take my shoes. Shoe, take my shoe. It's coming from the shoe. Coming from the shoe. The <laughs> take, take me. <laughs> <laughs> and the lady looked around and said, what's going on? <laughs> and it kept on, take me. Take me. So she looked around, put the shoe in her bag, and walked away. She was a nice Christian. She said, I never stole anything in my life, and now I'm asked to steal this shoe. <laughs> So the shoe disappeared, and later on, when New Brindavan rejoined Iskhan, she heard it, the voice again, I guess. Well, she took it home and put it in her closet and forgot about it. And then when we had deviated from Prabhupada's mood, 
But after some time it came back. As soon as it came back, she had a dream. And in the dream, she heard, said, bring the shoe back. <laughs> and she did. <laughs> No, actually, she was scared to see so she mailed it back. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> so Prabhupada is there, just like the deities are there. They're in the pictures. They're also in our heart. So if we follow these instructions, and we, as we learn, we should try to follow. We should, Prabhupada is our, we've joined ISKCON, and Prabhupada is our founder, Acharya. Therefore, as Chandramali has said, he's our example. We may, not, we may know he's, you know, realize he's an Uttamadakari. We may not know who he was, whatever. But he, we joined this movement, and he's the standard. His books are the basis. His books are the standard. And they're meant to help us contact the super soul in our heart so that he can help us make it clear what to do, how to do it, when to do it, etc., and we have so many leaders, so many nice leaders, so many nice examples, and we should learn how to see through Prabhupada's books those nice examples. And we should learn how to see through Prabhupada's books the bad examples. And we should learn how to see through Prabhupada's books how to not take so seriously, especially in the devotees, the bad examples, and only take seriously the good examples. Try to see this world, how Krishna is in charge of it. The whole universe is flowing from him. Not only, you know, theoretically in the Bhagavatam, but every single moment, everything that's going on is Krishna's arrangement. We may see that to different degrees. When I was doing books on Radha Damodar, I because for me, actually we were dis distributing different things, but the whole idea was money, Lakshmi. So I figured that what I do every day I went out to the lots, I just put a figure in my mind how much I wanted to collect that day. And everyone who gave me a donation, I just deducted from that figure. And at the end of the day, I just prayed to Krishna to make up the rest. And every day, Krishna would send someone out of nowhere and give me the amount of money needed to take up the rest. So that way I, I was seeing Krishna in my service. When I was in, first went to uh, Texas. Anyone here ever heard of Texas? Texas? <laughs> in America? <laughs> I, I, I can't remember. <laughs> Texas. And I was just, we were in, in Dodi's and Tilak, because that's all we had. When you joined the movement, you surrendered your karmi clothes. So uh, even, tra you know, anyhow, anywhere we went, there's no such thing as wearing those clothes, except for Dodi and Tila. So when we appeared in, in Houston, Texas, they thought we had come from another planet. <laughs> Matter of fact, as soon as we went out on the street, well, that was in Dallas. When we went on the street in Dallas, they immediately arrested us put us in jail, and charge us with impersonating women. <laughs> yeah. They couldn't see clearly, huh? <laughs> no, some lady had complained. She saw these men running around with dresses, so the police came and arrested her. It was in <laughs> I walked in the men's bathroom one place, and the guy said, Excuse me, ma'am, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> and then I... I didn't say anything. <laughs> we went on the street the first time in, in Houston. They arrested us. And they brought us to jail. And I was chanting. And the, the God comes and says, don't chant so loud. So I thought, well, this guy's in my head. I better chant louder. <laughs> <laughs> so I started to chant louder. He took out his gun. And he was going to hit me with a gun. I, 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 he wasn't going to shoot me. He took the other end. He was going to hit me over the head with it. <laughs> they, were, they didn't kid around. <laughs> so I, I thought, okay, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. <laughs> 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 they had the trial 
on TV. It was, it was, it was, uh, it was before the city council. The Hare Krishnas were on trial for chanting and distributing books on the street. What's that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, well, they, at that time, they didn't care what dress, just the fact that Martians had come. <laughs> so Vishnu Jamaraj was appearing on, on behalf of the three devotees in the Hare Krishna movement in Houston, the big threat. And uh, one man walked up to Vishnu Jamaraj and said, I'll give you, uh, he walked up to a reporter actually, he said, I'll give you $50, at that time it was a lot of money, if you hit the monk on t television. So the reporter went before the city council and said, I was just offered $50 if I hit this monk in, on television. And it was a big scandal, so they said, all right, this case is missed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was, I was on the street, there was Vishnu Jan Maharaj and, my, and Trinath and myself. And Vishnu Jan Maharaj, he didn't know how to distribute books because he was a fantastic kirtan leader. But as Prabhupada, when, when Tamil Krishna Maharaj went to Prabhupada and complained that Vishnu Jan Maharaj, all he wants to chant all the day, he, all time, he doesn't want to distribute any books. So Prabhupada smiled at, at Tamil Krishna Maharaj and said, Vish, Vish, by chanting Hare Krishna, Vishnu Jan Maharaj went back to Godhead. So he'd stand there holding the back to Godhead, and no one would take the back to Godhead. And our life depended on it. <laughs> Our food depended upon it. <laughs> the heat in our building depended upon it. Because our, our, the, the house that we're living in, you could actually, during the winter, it was snowing, and you could actually look at the walls and see the snow falling down. Because there were holes in the walls. <laughs> so, you know, it depended upon it. So I, had a, I was the only one who actually knew how, supposedly knew how to distribute books. And I couldn't figure it out, how to distribute books to the Texans in downtown Houston, ah. Texas. So all I would do is I stand there and I just pray, Krishna, Prabhupada, Krishna, please send someone. And someone would appear out of nowhere and say, hey, what's in your hand? <laughs> I, said, I give it to them. He said, oh yeah, this looks interesting. Give me a donation. And I go, please send someone else. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it, it actually worked. <laughs> Nothing else I did worked. We had, no t we had no techniques at that time. Generally, we got, eventually we learned these, quote, techniques. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they definitely worked, but got us into a lot of trouble, too. <laughs> I remember one fair I was, I was distributing books at. And I was, I, got, I was starting to get good at this, what was called the change-up. So I changed up one lady, and she got disturbed. And she complained to the people, the, the security at this fair. And the next thing I knew, I had five or six people with machine guns pointing at me. Tell them what a, tell them what a change up is. You don't know what a change up is? We can demonstrate it. Anyone here has $20? Yeah, we'll <laughs> <laughs> change up was you, you'd sell them the book, they say, sure, I'll give you a donation. They reach into the wallet, and they give you like, you know, seven dollars. And you go, well, actually, I, I got a lot of ones. Can I give you a change for the twenty? So you, the t you take the t seven, and they give you the twenty, and say, how much do you want back? What would you like to give? <laughs> so they give, the, I'll give ten. So you give them ten back, <laughs> and they walk away. <laughs> you never know quite what happened. What happened? <laughs> Most of the time it works, sometimes it, I mean, it, when it didn't work, it was really... <laughs> oh. <laughs> Anyhow, but the point was that if we rely upon Krishna, if we're put in a position where we have to rely upon Krishna, then we'll rely upon Krishna if we're devotees. And that will be such advancement. So all this is being arranged so we can actually take shelter of Krishna. But in order to do that, we actually have to know what the science is of taking shelter of Krishna. 
we have to have Krishna as our shelter. We have to become convinced that we don't have to wait till the last minute to take shelter of Krishna. We can take shelter of Krishna way before it's too late. Then this movement will become successful. If we actually take shelter of Prabhupada's instructions and through them actually take shelter sincerely of trying to please Krishna, then this movement will be successful. It won't be successful just by expanding the number of devotees who come and chant Hare Krishna for some time and then leave, or how many books we're distributing. These will not be the success. The ultimate success will be convinced that through Srila Prabhupada and his representatives, through our acharyas, through Lord Krishna, if we actually feel dependent upon them, then our, our movement will become successful. Not just one, but as much as the devotees, all of us take, feel like that, to that degree our movement will become successful. Just like one time, Prabhupada in 1968, he was, I think it was 68 or 67, Prabhupada was going to India and he was giving initiation and very liberally. This was in Portland. And one man stood up, who no one knew, and said, Shula Prabhupada, uh, he said, Swamiji, could I get initiated? And Prabhupada said, I just asked, I'll ask you two questions. Who is Krishna? And he said, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then Prabhupada said, so who are you? He said, I'm Krishna's servant. So he said, you can be initiated. <laughs> so those two things we have to learn. And then our movement will become successful. And then the man asked, another man said, Swamiji, what are you doing for the world? So Prabhupada said, well, have you taken up Krishna consciousness? Are you, uh, is it hap helping you? So the man said, yes. So the Prabhupada said, that's what I'm doing for the world. So that will be our success. As much as any one of us takes shelter of Krishna, Prabhupada's instructions, then this movement is becoming successful. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Surupada Vyasapurja Mahotsava Ki. Thank you so much for honorable guests for these inspiring words.